Okay, but I want to start by just telling you a little bit about the area broadly of machine learning that I work in. It goes without saying that we have complicated data that we want to make sense of. Okay, and complicated data, while you're here now, some new data sets are probably appearing on your hard drive. Complicated data can come in many forms. Okay, we might be scientists like physicists and we build big telescopes and measurement devices and then we collect terabytes and terabytes of data about the universe every second. Um, and we want to make sense of it. Maybe we uh, invented a social network and then you know, much of the world joined it and started communicating and sharing things with each other and, and um, connecting with friends and so on. Um, and we have now in the data of that, of that social network, we have a snapshot of, of communities unfolding and interacting and we want to make sense of that data. Maybe we have, we'll talk a little bit about this during um, these lectures, text data. Uh, we have a library worth of books and articles, uh, all in electronically readable form. And we want to, we're a historian, say, and we want to make sense of all of these uh, books and articles that we've collected in our library. Or maybe we're an economist and um, we have data about people shopping uh, at, a, at, at big supermarkets and we have millions and millions of people going on millions of shopping trips and we want to understand something about how people purchase items, about how they're sensitive to price or what kind of items go together or just something about the um, economics of choice. Um, and these are just four examples. I imagine in your field you have an example on the tip of your mind of some kind of complicated data set you might have access to that you want to make sense of. So let's dig into this kind of almost vacuous statement. First of all, what does it mean for data to be complicated? Well, at the, naively, data is more complicated these days because it's just bigger, right? We have more data points. We have terabytes of data from the, from the astronomers. And there are many dimensions. So we might measure many, many different things about each data point, okay? So this makes data more complicated than, say, 30 years ago. But data can be complicated in other ways, too. It might be unstructured. Okay, so when, when we have text data, for example, I think of that as unstructured data where even though one can represent it as a matrix, it's not naturally represented as a matrix. It's naturally a bunch of documents and each document is a collection of words. And um, the kind of your, you know, your grandparents' matrix of data of rows and columns doesn't really apply when it comes to something like text data. Okay, I think of that as unstructured data. Um, and then another way that data is more complicated and again different from your grandparents' data sets is that it's multimodal and interconnected, right? So thinking about this social network here, um, you know, the, the data is millions of people and they are connected with each other, right, in, in different ways. There's a graph on these data points. Um, and each one is communicating with each other with messages that are sometimes sent to subsets of them, sometimes sent to all of them. They're sharing links and text and clicks and images and so on. Um, and so this multimodality that there are many types of, many different types of information in these data and the interconnectedness of the data also make it complicated. Okay, so the point is data is complicated in, in many ways, not just that it's large. Now what does it mean to make sense of data? Well, the classical machine learning answer to that question is that making sense of data means that I want to make predictions about the future, okay? I ingest a bunch of data and I want to know what the next piece of data is going to look like, right? I get a bunch of communication on Facebook and I want to predict what the next communication is going to be. Okay, so that's one way to, and, in, and, and Shakir mentioned finance a bit, you know, that in finance, of course, making predictions about the future is probably a big part of, um, of what it means to make sense of data. But there's more to making sense of data than prediction. We might also want to identify interpretable patterns. Okay, so if I'm the historian and I have this big collection of text documents, I want to know what patterns of language permeated through history. And I want to form my historical theories based on those patterns and I need them to be interpretable. So I want to ingest all this text and I want to find interpretable patterns of words that recur in the text. And, no, oh. can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, interpretable patterns of words that, that recur in the text and then and, and be able to relate them to things in the real world. Okay, then that's different from prediction. I might be able to make a prediction without being able to interpret why or how that prediction is made. And then most 
ambitiously, which we heard about this morning from Bernard, is to do science, right? I want to ingest this data, but I want to actually not just interpret the results of my machine learning algorithm and not just make predictions of the future, but I want to understand the world as it really exists through the data. I want to understand how the universe works from the data that I've collected about the stars. And that is causal inference. I want to confirm, elaborate, maybe hypothesize, form, causal theories about the world from my data. And it's, this is, you know, in, in Facebook, for example, I might want to understand, I might be a sociologist, and I want to understand how people work and how communities are formed. But these are causal inference problems. These are different from prediction problems. Okay, so these are all different ways that we might want to make sense of data. And so the field in machine learning that I work in, probabilistic machine learning, is about answering all of these kinds of questions by developing machine learning methods that connect our domain knowledge and assumptions and theories to the data that we're trying to analyze. Okay, so probabilistic machine learning looks a lot like applied Bayesian statistics, if you're um, familiar with that. And what probabilistic machine learning does, it provides a methodology for scalably modeling large, interesting, interconnected, complicated data sets. Um, that in a way that both acknowledges our assumptions about the data and lets the data speak in the sense of let the data inform what we then learn about it. Okay, and you'll see examples of this concretely through these talks. And our goal broadly in probabilistic machine learning is to develop this methodology so that it's expressive, meaning that we can encode many different types of domain assumptions, say about the universe or about people, into our methods. It's scalable so that we can um, handle, so, so that we can use these methods on very large and complicated data sets and easy to develop, which means that we can quickly build models and compute about those models and not have to do a lot of deep mathematical work in order to be able to use probabilistic machine learning. And of course, this is building directly on what Shakir has told you about already for three hours. Okay, so just, I wanna show you some examples of um, the results of probabilistic machine learning. I think all these examples come from the research in my lab, just because I have those pictures handy. Um, and in my lab, we've worked a lot on the, the develop, finding interpretable patterns in big unstructured data sets aspect of this, of this work. Okay, so for example, we might, be, we might ingest a big social network of people, of people talking to each other. In this case, it's patents citing each other. And we want to understand what communities of people exist in that network. Okay, so here's a picture where in comes just the network, what is connected to what, and out pops this color coding of the network in terms of communities of densely interconnected collections of nodes. We'll talk about the application later on. These are topics found in 1.8 million articles from the New York Times. So this is the historian analyzing the library. So here what comes into the probabilistic machine learning algorithm is a bunch of text documents. And what pops out are called topics. We'll talk about them more formally, but loosely what a topic is, you can maybe see one here, one team, second race, round, cup, open game, play, win. These are words that seem to go together under a single theme, okay, but they're discovered by the algorithm. So in comes all the documents from the New York Times, 1.8 million of them, and out pops this idea that, oh, you know, a bunch of these somehow involve sports. All right, and here are words that go together with sports. There's no label data. None of the documents are labeled as being about sports or not. Um, it's all, it's an unsupervised learning method. Okay, here's a related method that uh, analyzes uh, genes. So this is a population analysis, of two billion genetic measurements. And the idea here, it's really just a pretty picture because it's got lots of colors. But um, w what this is, is in comes, you know, we might, we all um, spit into a test tube and send our uh, test tubes to 23andMe or whatever, they, they sequence our genes. And then this is an analysis of a big collection of, of genes with the idea that each person somehow mixes different ancestral populations. Okay, so millions and millions of years ago, ancestral populations roamed the earth reproducing and it all bottomed out in us, in this room. And each of us exhibits those populations to different degrees. And this kind of algorithm then tries to uncover what those populations are and model each person as mixing several of those populations. Here is a neuroscience analysis of um, 
a big fMRI data set. Okay, so here, totally different. We are ingesting fMRI data. This is, um, so what happens? People get put into machines, um, fMRI machines, and then they show them pictures of like shoes and, and chairs and stuff like that. It's pretty fun. And, um, and, w w and the scientists are measuring what's going on in their brain as they're, as they're in the machine. And um, what the model does is then identify the locations in the brain that are most active under different types of stimuli. Okay, so I actually don't remember what this picture even means, but it's kind of like, um, you know, if you're looking at chairs, then these, these, these areas of the brain that are marked with blue are, are, high, are on often, and if you're looking at, um, what was the other thing I said, shoes? If you're looking at shoes, then the areas marked in red are on. And, and what the algorithm does is just take raw data of these little tiny voxels of brain activity and figures out, oh, these are the areas that seem to be most active, and here's when they are active. Okay, here's the important problem of analyzing taxi trajectories. Here's an analysis of declassified cables using things like topic modeling to identify world events. Um, this we'll get to later. This is a, uh, of the economic model, the model of people shopping. And here what we're doing is we're learning latent features in items in the supermarket. And this is work we did with an economist. And this picture tells you that crackers and cheese go together well. So this was a really big result in economics. <laughs> okay. So I, it, it was a whirlwind tour of lots of different types of results. The reason I showed you all those pictures of the types of patterns that we learned with probabilistic modeling is to be able to show you this picture, which I call the probabilistic pipeline. And th this is the basic set of activities that we do when we develop probabilistic machine learning algorithms. And the idea is that we start off with our knowledge of the world and some question we want to answer about the world, okay? We have knowledge and a question, and, or the, the, the knowledge could be assumptions, and we use that knowledge, assumptions, and question to build a model, and I'll get to graphical models in a little bit, but the model is basically a probabilistic model of hidden and observed variables. Okay, there's some hidden random variables, there's some observed random variables. We build a joint distribution of hidden and observed random variables that somehow reflect both the question we're trying to answer and the knowledge we have of the world. And that's the model. Then, given our data set, say the, the gene sequences and our model of how these gene sequences mix ancestral populations that are unobserved, we uncover the patterns in the data. So we take our data and our model and we somehow square them off. But more formally, what we do is we infer the hidden variables given the observed variables. And that's discovering the patterns. And then we use those discovered patterns to form predictions and explore the world um, through our analysis. Okay, I like this picture because it separates these activities, which, I'm, which we're gonna separate today as well. The one activity is model building. What is the kind of joint distribution of hidden and observed random variables that I want to use? Another activity is algorithmic. Given that model and my big data set, how do I infer the hidden structure that, that lives in the model? So if I am given a big social network, how do I infer those communities that I showed you? If I'm given a big collection of New York Times articles, how do I infer those topics? Okay, that's somehow squaring the model and the data, as I said. And then the last activity is to then use the results of that inference. That's for things like causal inference and exploring data and forming predictions and building, building real artifacts, machine learning artifacts comes in. Right? That uses the results of these inferences to do something useful. Okay, and I like this picture because it separates those activities and it makes it easy then to collaborate with domain experts on machine learning problems, on developing new machine learning methods. Okay. But what we're gonna mainly talk about for three hours is, or for forever, because the battery will never run out, is um, posterior inference. Okay, so the key algorithmic problem lives in this box, discover patterns. That answers the question, given my model of how communities form and how social network reflects communities, what does it say about this particular social network that I'm analyzing? What are the communities in that social network? Right, this answers the question, what are the topics in this data set? Right, so what does this model that I develop based on my assumptions say about this data that I care about? That's posterior inference. And as I mentioned before, our goal 
is to make posterior inference scalable, but also to make it general, right? We want posterior inference to be able to, we want algorithms that we can use with many, many, many models, and we want algorithms that we can use on very large data sets. Okay, and so why do we want that? Well, I drew this pipeline here as though it's, it has an end, right? It ends with predicting and exploring. And when you have to work really hard to develop algorithms, then you are committed to writing a paper about whatever it is you just did, okay? But if we had easy ways to do posterior inference, if we had easy ways to solve this problem of conditioning on the observations and estimating the hidden variables, then what we really want is to think about this loop, which I call Box's loop, named after George Box, who's a great statistician. Um, where we make assumptions about the world, we discover patterns based on our data and those assumptions, we use those discovered patterns to do something, form predictions, explore, causal inference, whatever, and then we look critically at what just happened and we ask, okay, how did things work? Did they work well? Did they not work well? And um, then let's use what we learn in that criticism phase to then revise our assumptions. I call this boxes loop, okay, to go around and around, continually building, revising and checking models. Sorry, continually building, analyzing data and then checking the results to then revise the model. Um, and if the bottleneck is to do mathematical work to develop posterior inference algorithms, then um, scalable and general inference algorithms will help lubricate this pipeline. Okay. I don't know what that just was because we're about to start with the introduction. By the way, please interrupt me. So if there are any questions at any time, I'm, you know, definitely only going to speak as long as they let me, but I'm happy to not get through all my slides if, you know, it means that it's clear what we do go through. So please feel free to uh, interrupt me. Okay, so that's our goal, to develop posterior inference algorithms. And let's um, get a little bit more formal. So you've already seen this, but a probabilistic model, as I mentioned, is a joint distribution of hidden variables Z and observed variables x, okay? So we're gonna sometimes have beta as well as a hidden variable, but for now just z and x. So we have a joint distribution of z and x. That's a probability model. Inference about the unknowns, the hidden variables, happens through the posterior distribution, which is the conditional distribution of the hidden variables given the observations. Okay, so that's this equation here, p of z given x, which as you know from the definition of conditional probability is the joint P of Z and X divided by the marginal distribution of the observations P of X. Now for most interesting models, for most models that we care about, that denominator is not tractable to compute. You can't efficiently calculate it or calculate it at all. And so we have to appeal to approximate posterior inference. We have to play the game of trying to approximate this conditional distribution. Given my model and my data, what is P of Z given X? So this picture, Shakir and Rajesh Ranganath and I came up with this picture when we were developing that tutorial that Shakir mentioned, um, really says everything we need to say about variational inference. So variational inference is an approach to approximating that conditional distribution. And um, I wanna pause here for a little while and meditate on this picture. So here is the basic idea behind variational inference. Variational inference solves that inference problem. Here when I say inference, I mean calculating P of Z given X with optimization. Okay, for those of you familiar with MCMC, if I had a slide about MCMC, it would say MCMC solves inference with sampling. Okay, but I'm solving inference with optimization. And the idea is as follows. So imagine, <clears throat> So imagine the space on the slide, every point on that space is some distribution over Z, okay? There's some distribution over the hidden variables. My model is fixed, P of Z and X is fixed. I'm interested in P of Z given X, my data is fixed too. And every point on the slide is a distribution over Z. And so the idea behind variational inference is the following. First, I'm going to set up a family of distributions of Z. Okay, and I've outlined that with an ellipse here. So there's this big space of distributions, but there's um, a subset of those distributions, a family, um, inside that ellipse. Each point in that ellipse is a distribution over Z, and it's parameterized by variational parameters. Okay, variational parameters which we're denoting nu. So every point in this ellipse, let me just 
positions of this chair. Second point. Every point in this ellipse is a distribution over z and corresponds to a particular value of the variational parameters nu. Is that clear? Now, our target distribution is p of z given x, right? So p of z given x is a distribution over z, so it's somewhere on our slide, and there it is. It lives outside this family, but that's what we're trying to approximate. And so the idea behind variational inference is to, within this family, find the member, which I'm denoting nu star here, that is closest to that conditional distribution that we care about, p of z given x, the posterior. Okay, I want to find the nu star such that the corresponding distribution of z is closest to p of z given x. Closeness is measured by the KL divergence, an information theoretic measure of um, closeness of two distributions. And so the idea is to start at some initial set of variational parameters, nu and it, and then to optimize, minimize that KL divergence to find the point closest to p of z given x. Okay, now I'm omitting all kinds of details here, such as it's not possible, but this is the idea, okay? Um, that's it. I want to say more, but I just want you to stare at that picture longer and burn it onto your um, eyeballs, okay? So I have, a, I have a family of distributions over z. It's parameterized by nu. I start with an initial nu, and I run an optimization procedure to get to the nu that is closest to the exact posterior that I care about. Question? Correct. We know p of z comma x, but we don't know p of z given x. Okay. So, What's your name, by the way? Uh, my name is Anshuman. Say it again. Anshuman. Anshuman. Okay. So my, my question is, when we do not know uh, the, the p of z given x, how do we measure this? Thing? Yeah. That's one of the details that I'm skirting over, but I will get to it. Yeah. Right. So Anshuman makes a good point. If I don't know p of z given x, how on earth do I optimize something that depends on it? And so, you know, it, it's, it's going to be, the answer is luck. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. What's your name? Alan. Alan. Ah, I'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah, question. Yeah, so it relates to Anshuman's question. The answer is that then, because we can write down this optimization. So we, we can't calculate it, but there is research, current research, on using other forms of um, measuring distances between distributions. Um, and so the reason I wanted you to stare at this picture so long is that actually when you, you, know, you, when you start looking at the archive, which is sort of a mixed blessing, you, um, you can take lots and lots of the papers about variational inference that are coming out in the archive and situate them inside this picture. Okay. Um, a brief answer to your question about why it's called variational. Loosely, variational means anytime I'm turning some calculation that I want to make that's hard into an optimization. And so that's what we're doing here. Ah, because if I could put, if I could put the family to, in, to, if I could enclose the posterior with the family, then the family would be too hard to work with then I wouldn't really have a problem. I could calculate the posterior. Okay, so here's an example just to make things concrete. So let's say we're trying to fit a mixture of Gaussians. Okay, so I have a clustering model of Gaussians. My hidden variable is the, is the, is the cluster assignment of each data point, and I'm trying to find the clusters. Okay, so here in the, in the left is, um, is my original data. Now the data here have colors, but they don't really have colors. The, the, the algorithm just sees the, data, the raw data. And our goal is to cluster this data. And let's say I magically know that it's one, two, three, four, five clusters or something like that. Um, the way the algorithm works, um, so we're, what we're plotting here is the posterior predictive distribution of the next data point. So if I'm going to use my posterior to form a prediction, this is the prediction of where the next data, data point is going to lie. And when I run variational inference, what you can see is that at first, I have no good sense of where the next data point is going to come. And as variational inference proceeds, my estimate of the posterior predictive distribution, the next, the, the, the 
place where the next data point is going to be gets better and better and better. And here I have indeed, through the posterior predictive, captured the distribution of the data. Okay, here in, this, in these pictures, um, just look at this one here, the evidence lower bound. This is like the KL divergence, and, um, where higher means lower KL divergence. Okay, the higher this is, the closer my approximate posterior is to the exact posterior. What you can see is that we start out with nu and it, and then we, we get better and better and better, and then we converge somewhere. We don't know how far away from the exact posterior we are, but we've converged somewhere to be closer to the exact posterior than we started. Okay, that's the idea. And the main takeaway from this slide is we have turned inference into an optimization. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today and tomorrow? Again, variational inference solves the posterior inference problem with optimization. And what I want to talk about are the basics of variational inference, how to scale variational inference up to massive data sets. That's an algorithm called stochastic variational inference and then how to develop variational inference to be easily applied to a wide class of difficult models. So when I talk about the basics, we're going to constrain the model class, and later we're going to expand the model class. And that relates to what Shakir was discussing with things like normalizing flows and reparameterization gradients and so on. But we'll get to that tomorrow. Okay, so there are no prerequisites, of course, but um, the, you know, what I'm kind of hoping you are familiar with is a little probability. So terms like the joint distribution, the conditional distribution, I hope are familiar to you. Terms like expectation and conditional expectation, which Shakir also went over, I hope are familiar to you. Um, a little optimization, by which I just mean knowing what optimization is. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about gradient-based optimization and coordinate uh, ascent optimization. And um, it'd be good if you knew a little bit of Bayesian statistics but you don't have to be a Bayesian. Are any of you Bayesians? Just one, two. Yeah, I'm kind of a half Bayesian. Um, what we will learn about is this. Like I said, the basics of variational inference, which include mean field variational inference and coordinate ascent optimization for variational inference. Then, like I said, we'll talk about stochastic variational inference to scale it up, and black box variational inference, which generalizes it. And in order to make our conversation more concrete, I want to talk about real models along the way. So again, I like to divide modeling and inference, and so sometimes we will discuss some models, and then we'll discuss inference, and then I'll show you how inference applies to those models. Um, but in particular, we'll talk about latent Dirichlet allocation and topic models, deep exponential families, uh, embedding models of consumer behavior, that's the model that tells us that crackers and cheese go well together, and then deep generative models, which is a um, way to do Bayesian deep learning. Now, as to your question about why it's called variational, so I gave one answer, but the, there's a historical reason too. So variational inference, the history of this set of ideas is that um, is that machine learning researchers and physicists who got interested in machine learning started adapting ideas from statistical physics um, to probabilistic inference. Okay, so um, uh, two physicists, Peterson and Anderson, in 1987, they fit a neural network with mean field methods. This was back when neural networks were popular. Um, the idea then was picked up by several machine learning researchers like um, Mike Jordan in Mike Jordan's lab. Uh, in the late 90s, Mike Jordan and Tommy Yakula and Lawrence Saul, Zubin Garamani, they read this paper and picked up on it and started generalizing variational inference algorithms to other models, to other probabilistic models. And a really good review paper where I learned about this stuff is Jordan's um, and, and these other guys' review paper from 1999. Um, at the same time, Jeff Hinton and um, David Mackay and others, Chris Bishop also started developing variational methods for neural networks again and for other models. Um, and so all this was kind of happening in the early 1990s. Now why we're talking about it today, it's, it's past the 1990s today, um, is that there's lately been a new flurry of work on variational inference. Again, making it scalable, easier to derive, making it faster, making it more accurate. 
And variational inference nowadays touches many areas in machine learning, not just uh, kind of classical Bayesian modeling, but probabilistic programming and reinforcement learning and neural networks and convex optimization and Bayesian statistics all involve variational inference. Um, and so uh, what I want to do today is talk about some of these early ideas, but then quickly get to these newer ideas and, and try to um, tell you a little bit about why they might be important. I want to mention that to the degree that I'm going to talk about the work from my lab, this is work with um, some of my collaborators from the last uh, 10 years or so, Matt Hoffman, Rajesh Ranganath, and Alp Kuchu Kelbir. Okay. So let's start by talking about the basics of variational inference, but again, I want to do this in the context of models, so I want to first talk a little bit with you about topic modeling. All right, so what's the problem of topic modeling? What topic modeling is about is I have a big collection of documents, and I want to use posterior inference to discover the hidden themes or topics that pervade those documents, because I just want to sort of use those for some prediction, or I want to know what's going on in this big collection. I'm a historian, and I don't have time to read them all. And the model I want to use as an example model for variational inference is called latent Dirichlet allocation. And the idea behind this model is that, so when we, when we build probability models, we have an intuition about what kinds of assumptions we might want to make in that probability model. And here the intuition is that, you know, I want to understand topics from a big data set of documents, but the intuition is that documents exhibit multiple topics. Okay, so here's a document. This is from the journal Science. It's called Seeking Life's Bare Genetic Necessities. And what this article is about at a high level is the scientists um, use some computational methods to understand the number of genes that an organism needs to survive in an evolutionary sense, like over millions of years. Okay? And um, what I've done by hand is just highlighted different words in this article just to kind of solidify this intuition behind LDA for you. Okay, so words like organism, life, survive, words about evolutionary biology, those are highlighted in pink. Words like genes, genomes, sequenced, words about genetics, those are highlighted in yellow. And words like predictions, computer analysis, computational numbers, words about data analysis, those are highlighted in blue. Now, the idea here is that imagine I um, took the time to highlight every word in this article with, a, with its appropriate color, and also throw out words like of and the and but and and, things that are, um, have no semantic meaning, um, and then squint, okay? And then you squint at the article. You can do it here if you like. What you'd see is that a big blend of blue and yellow and pink and uh, blue and yellow and pink and so while you wouldn't know what the article is about, you would see that, you know, I don't know what this article is about, but it does somehow blend genetics, evolutionary biology, and data analysis. Okay, and so that's what LDA is trying to do. It's trying to construct a representation of these articles so that you can squint at them and say loosely what they are about. And so what we're going to do is, in building the model, is we're going to embed that intuition into a formal generative process of data. And so one way to articulate the assumptions that a probability model makes is to describe the generative process that it assumes data came from, okay? Like every probability model has with it a generative process that it uses to generate data, that it could use to generate data. And so we want a generative process that captures this assumptions that documents exhibit multiple topics, and so here is what it is for LDA. So first, let's define a topic more formally as a distribution over terms in a vocabulary. Okay, so here on the left are a bunch of topics. Here's a topic that has words like data, number, computer with high probability. Here's a topic that has words like, do you, when I hear it cut out, do you hear it cut out? But do you hear me anyway? Okay. Um, here's a topic that has words like brain, neuron, and nerve with high probability. Here's a topic that has words like life, evolved, organism with high probability, and so on. Okay, so these are topics. Now, to be clear, each topic is like a weighted die with the entire vocabulary on each face of the die. And so, or each face has a vocabulary term. And so, the word nerve has some low probability under this topic. Okay, now, so we have our topics. And, and now the generative process is for each document, I choose a distribution over the topics. Okay, so here I chose the pink, the... Oh, I got one, yeah. I just, I need a little exercise. 
Um, so here I chose the pink, the yellow, and the blue. Uh, or here, here I drew a distribution that has pink, yellow, and blue. And then for each word, each observed word in the document, I choose a colored button from this distribution. Here I chose the blue button. And then I look up the topic associated with the blue button, and I choose a word from that topic. So here I chose the blue button, and then I choose the word analysis. Here I choose the yellow button, and then I chose the word genes. Here I chose the pink button, and I choose the word life. And each time I'm drawing the word from the corresponding distribution over words. Okay, and so you chick, 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 you write your article that way, then you turn the page, you're gonna write the next article in science, and you choose a new distribution over topics. Okay, what's important is that the same set of topics are at play, it's just that the new article mixes them with different proportions. Clear? Okay. So, that's the probability model. What's the posterior inference problem? Well, the problem is that, you know, this is our fantasy, that, we, that, that this is how the documents arose. But really, we only get to observe the documents, right? All of this other stuff is, hid, is hidden structure, stuff we can't observe. And so the posterior inference problem is to fill in all of this blank latent variables given the observations, the documents themselves. And that is the posterior, the probability of the topics the topic proportions, and the topic assignments given the documents. Okay, and so just, I went over that a little slowly, but notice that I turned the problem of discovering topics from a document collection, which is kind of a vague, amorphous problem, into now a calculation of a posterior distribution under a formal probability model. Also notice that we're gonna wanna do this at large scale. There are millions of documents, and that means there are billions of latent variables. Okay, so in machine learning, we like to use graphical models to represent probability models. And a graphical model basically represents a factorization of the joint distribution of hidden and observed random variables at play, in this case, topic proportions and so on. And graphical models is a whole field. We could have a lecturer come here to talk about graphical models and all of the, its impl implications. Um, but the idea is that a graphical model encodes assumptions about data connects those assumptions to algorithms for computing with the data, and essentially defines the posterior we care about through the joint. The graphical model is a picture of the joint distribution, and so it's, it defines the posterior. And so you can kind of read that generative process I showed you from this graphical model for LDA, where, so I should say, so nodes are random variables, edges means that there's some kind of dependence between random variables in the generative process, and these plates, these rectangles are called plates, they denote replication. Okay, so the generative process for LDA is first choose a bunch of topics, beta k, so each beta is a distribution over terms, these are the topics, and there's k of them. Then for each document, choose the topic proportions theta from some distribution, it's a Dirichlet distribution. And then for each word in each document, choose a colored button from theta, and then choose the word from the corresponding topic that that colored button points to. Okay, so this is the same picture of the generative process, but as a graph, and this graph connects to algorithms. Um, and notice also that everything is hidden except for the words, right? All I get to see is the words, everything else is somehow hidden. I, I can't remember if I mentioned, shaded nodes are observed, unshaded nodes are hidden. Okay, so again, with LDA, the posterior of the latent variables given the documents is here, it's the joint divided by the marginal, and the problem is that we can't compute that marginal distribution, okay? And so we're gonna use variational inference to approximate this posterior. So I haven't talked about the algorithm yet, but let's imagine we've got the inference algorithm, we can approximate the posterior. What is this algorithm gonna do? Well, so here is a picture of a real analysis of these. So we took 17,000 articles from science, and we fit a 100 topic topic model. So we found 100 topics, 100 distributions over terms for these 17,000 articles. That's basically calculating that posterior. Now, here is that article I showed you. And here on the right is the, um, is the posterior expectation of the topic proportions for that article. So just to be clear, we ingest 17,000 articles. We find 100 topics from them. Now we ask, what is the theta what is the distribution over topics for this article? And you can see that the posterior for it, so there's 100 topics at play, and the posterior is only somehow activating a handful of them to describe the words of this article. Okay, this is P of theta given these words and the topics. 
Now, moreover, each topic is a distribution over terms, so we can ask for the top most frequent terms from the top most frequent topics, and you can see things like human, genome, DNA, genetic, evolution, evolutionary species, organism, disease, bacteria, resistance, bacterial, computer models, information, data, and so on. These topics are interpretable, right? They each are, and, and these somehow rep represent these threads of ideas that, that this article seems to be about. Hey, I can do this with, like I showed you already, the New York Times. And here, what we see is that, you know, these now are the most frequent words from, from each topic. And you can see that without any kind of supervision, just ingesting millions of articles, the algorithm can uncover the various themes that pervade the articles. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. So, what is the algorithm that can take that model specification and the data and form a posterior that gives us these interpretable topics. Do you think I'm doing something wrong with the microphone? Maybe I should move it closer. Okay. Um, and so the roadmap for, for the, the next ideas is to first define a general class of probability models that LDA is going to be a member of, then derive the classical variational inference algorithm for that class of models, and then derive the stochastic variational inference algorithm, which scales to massive data, so we can do things like analyze millions of articles. Okay. So the class is called conditionally conjugate models, and it's very generic. So my observations, we're going to denote x. Okay, there's n observations, x1 through n. We're going to denote what are called local hidden variables z. All right, a local hidden variable, there's one per observation, so z1 to n. These can be vectors or collections themselves, it's okay. The global hidden variables are called beta. And the difference between a local and a global hidden variable is that the ith data point, xi, only depends on the global hidden variables beta and its local hidden variable zi. In other words, in the generative process, the ith data point does not depend on the jth local variable. Okay? Here is the factorized joint distribution that respects those assumptions. Probability of beta z and x is the probability of beta times conditionally independent, the probability of z and x given beta. And here's the graphical model for that factorized joint. Okay, where I have beta and I have z and x in a plate. Okay, and again, if you study graphical models, which I recommend you do, then you can see things like the independence assumption of zi not being dependent on, of, of xi not being dependent on zj from this graph. Our goal, as always, is to calculate p of beta and z given x. That's the posterior in this generic class of models. So I want to define for you what's called the complete conditional. The complete conditional is the conditional distribution of a latent variable given all the observations and all the other latent variables, okay? And so we're going to assume that each complete conditional is in the exponential family. So I'm going to tell you about the exponential family in a second, but let me just show you the math here first. So first look at this second equation here, p of beta given z and x. So p of beta given z and x is in an exponential family, and what's important about this equation is that the parameter to this distribution is eta sub g of z and x, and it's a function of what I'm conditioning on. Okay, so this is the complete conditional. It's the latent variable given the observations and the other latent variables, and its parameter is, of course, a function of what I'm conditioning on, and it has this nice exponential form. Okay? The complete conditional for z, for the local hidden variable, depends on only its observation xi and beta. That's a consequence of these independent assumptions we're making. It has the same nice exponential family form, and its parameter is also a function of what it's conditioned on. Okay, these are the complete conditionals. If you're familiar with MCMC, all of, MC, all of Gibbs sampling is to, is to iteratively sample each latent variable from its complete conditional. Okay, and the exponential family is a general way to write down many of the distributions that we use. Gaussian, Bernoulli, Poisson, Dirichlet, Gamma, etc. These are all in the exponential family. Some distributions are not in the exponential family. Okay, so as an aside, it might be the most useful thing you learned today. Um, let me just tell you a little bit. Well, how many of you are familiar with the exponential family? Raise your hand high. Okay, 
So it's less than half. So let me explain the exponential family since it's a useful idea to know about. Okay, so just put everything else on hold. Here's a distribution of x. And if it has an exponential family, if it's in the exponential family, it can be written in the following form. P of x equals h of x times e to the eta transpose t of x, t is some function of x, minus a of eta. A is a function of eta, okay? Now, these different characters have names. So eta is, the, is called the natural parameter. T of x are called the sufficient statistics. It's a, it's a function just of x. A of eta, it's a function just of the parameter, is called the log normalizer. And h of x is called the base density or the carrier density. It's actually got many names. And um, I used to say, you know, it's not important. You should just ignore h of x. But it's important, unfortunately. But it's not important for us today. Um, so, so, so these are the names of the characters in the exponential family. Now, the log normalizer is special. So the log normalizer, it ensures, as you know, a distribution has to integrate to 1, and it ensures that this integrates to 1. Okay, so a of eta is log of the integral of e to the eta transpose t of x dx. And this, if you plug it in up there, ensures that when you integrate p of x over x, you get 1. Okay? The log normalizer has a special property that we like, which is that its gradients calculate the expected sufficient statistics. Okay, so e of t of x is some property of this distribution, right? If I hand you a distribution of x, it has some expectation of t of x. And e of t of x is a property of this distribution. And in particular, e of t of x is the gradient of the log normalizer with respect to eta. Okay? And um, if you like probabilistic modeling, I encourage you to go home and prove that. Uh, on a piece of paper. It's, it's easy. Start with the definition of A of eta and prove this fact. Okay, so as I said, many common distributions are in the exponential family. Bernoulli, categorical, Gaussian, Poisson, beta, Dirichlet, gamma, et cetera, et cetera. The exponential family outlines the beautiful theory around conjugate priors and corresponding posteriors um, and connects closely to variational inference. Okay, so after my lectures today and tomorrow, if you want to challenge download this 300-page paper by Martin Wainwright and Mike Jordan and read it. It's about the connection between exponential families and variational inference. Okay. All good on the exponential family? That's the exponential family. So what we're assuming in this class of models is that whatever model I have, I might be doing physics or social network analysis or I'm doing finance and I'm predicting stock prices, but whatever model I made up, I need the fact, I need that the con complete conditional of each latent variable, given the others, is, can be written down in an exponential family. It might be Gaussian, gamma, Poisson, whatever, but it's got to be in the exponential family. Okay, so each complete conditional is in the exponential family, and it turns out that the global parameter, the complete conditional for the global hidden variable, has this parameter eta sub g of z of x, z and x, and it's going to have a special form going to look like some kind of hyperparameter alpha plus a sum over all the data points of a function of the local hidden variable and the data. I kind of overloaded t there. That can just be, it's going to be a function. Okay, and so this is going to become important, but the point is that the complete conditional for, let me get back to it because it's so important. So the complete conditional of beta given z and x it has a natural parameter, eta sub g of z, of z and x, and that natural parameter is going to have a special form. I'll go back to the form now, which is some vector plus a sum for each data point of a function of the local hidden variable and the data point. And notice that when we're trafficking in complete conditionals, we can refer to, to hidden variables as long as they're not the one that, we're, that we are that we are defining the complete conditional of, right? The complete, that we're deriving the complete conditional of. Okay, so we can use local hidden variables in the complete conditional because we're conditioning on them. Any questions? All right, so that class of models describes like many of the models that were developed in the 90s and 2000s in machine learning. 
okay, Bayesian mixture models, time series models, factorial mixture models and factorial time series models, matrix factorization like factor analysis and probabilistic PCA and probabilistic CCA, Bayesian nonparametric models like Dirichlet process mixtures and hierarchical Dirichlet processes, certain multi-level regression models like linear regression, probit regression, Poisson regression, stochastic block models, which are models of, of, of finding communities in uh, social networks, mixed membership models like LDA and some variants. Those are called mixed membership models because um, they model each document as a mixture, but they share mixture components across documents. Um, these are all can be written in this way, and they all have the property that they can be written down like this, and the complete conditionals are in exponential families. Okay, so you can probably anticipate what we're gonna do. We're gonna derive a variational inference algorithm, one second, for this class of models, and that then gives us variational inference for all these models and more, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Great, two great questions. So the first question was, um, is the number of topics a hyperparameter? And the answer is yes. So you, you are in charge of setting the number of topics, and there's lots of ways to do that with things like cross-validation or fancier things like Bayesian nonparametrics. Hierarchical Dirichlet processes can be interpreted as a form of LDA where the number of topics is determined by the data. Um, those lists of words I showed, those were the top most frequent words from topics, right? And you asked, you know, if I went further down that list, you know, would that make them more interpretable or less interpretable? You know, I see that as a problem in that last phase of Box's loop. Like, once I have my posterior, what do I then do with that posterior to be useful? If you run an internet company and you're showing topics to your customers, Maybe your customers only want to see three words, and so you have to choose the right three words. Maybe the top most frequent isn't, isn't the right, the right um, way to sh choose those three words. Maybe you want to use something else. If you are, have a different population that you're, that you're working with, maybe you want to show 30 words. Um, maybe you want to show a word cloud with the words, the size of the words being uh, frequency in the topic. The point is, all of those things are something that you're dreaming up right now that, that I'm not saying. Those are all functions of the posterior, okay? So the, the idea is that I've got my model, I've got my data in my model to give me my posterior, and then whatever I do downstream with the model, that's a function of the posterior. So we need to approximate the posterior in order to implement that function. Um, and again, this is the division of these activities. Yeah. Good question. Okay, so. I'm gonna show you this Venn diagram a few times. Um, but here, imagine the space of the slide is models. Okay, these are just all possible probabilistic models. And this isn't gonna be the scale, but here are the conditionally conjugate models. Okay, it's a subset of all models. Many models are not conditionally conjugate, but like I showed you, a lot of models are. Okay, and so we're now gonna do inference for this class of models, conditionally conjugate models. So we've set up our model, P of beta, Z, and X. And remember, our goal is to minimize the KL divergence between some family of, between a, a, a it, to minimize the KL divergence within a family of distributions of the hidden variables beta and Z, um, and the exact posterior, P of Z given X. That should say P of Z and beta given X. Actually, this all should have beta in it, right? So this is our goal. Now, as you mentioned, the, you know, how do you minimize something that depends on the intractable quantity that you care about, right? The KL divergence um, depends on P of beta and Z given X. And so this is an important idea in variational inference called the evidence lower bound. Yeah, actually, so uh, the evidence lower bound was coined in a paper in 2008 by John McAuliffe and Michael Braun. Um, uh, 
it, before that it was called the variational objective, basically. And the idea is that the KL is intractable, and so in variational inference, we optimize instead the evidence lower bound, or the elbow. Okay, and this is the elbow. I'll, I'll explain it in a bit. It's a lower bound on log P of X. So it's a lower bound on log of the quantity that makes inference hard. And this is what's important. Maximizing the elbow is equivalent to minimizing the KL. All right, so the difference between the elbow and the KL divergence that we care about is an additive constant. So that means that when I maximize the elbow, and the elbow, the elbow is negative KL plus an additive constant. So maximizing the elbow is the same as minimizing the KL. If I found the maximum of the elbow, I have also found the KL minimizer. Now, let's look at the elbow. Here it is. First of all, so remember the characters at play. I have Q of beta and Z with variational parameters nu, and I have the posterior, P of beta and Z given X, and I have the joint, P of beta comma Z comma X. And the elbow, here it is, has two terms. So first of all, the elbow, calligraphic L, is a function of the variational parameters alone, right? I'm gonna optimize it with respect to the variational parameters, so that's good. And it's a function with two terms. The first term is the expected complete log likelihood. All right, so the complete log likelihood is the log probability of the hidden variables and the observations. Put a different way, this is the model. All right, I call this the model. Log P of beta comma Z comma X is the model. That's how you specify the model. And what we're taking here in this first term is the expectation of the log joint with respect to Q, okay? And so here, X is fixed, that's the data, Z and beta, are both random variables, but they are drawn from Q, all right? And so this is an expectation of a function of these random variables drawn from Q. So this is a function then of the parameters of Q, in other words, the variational parameters nu. Is that clear? Okay, so the expected log joint is the first term. The second term is the negative entropy, E log Q of beta and Z with parameters nu, all right? So minus this is the entropy, but this is the um, second term. It only depends on Q, it only depends on the variational uh, family, and it's a, still an expectation with respect to Q of these random variables, okay? Now, these terms provide for us a trade-off, okay? So if you stare at the first term, the answer's on this slide, unfortunately, but um, you know, let's suppose I just wanted to optimize Q with respect to the first term. What's, what, what's the best Q? Yeah. Exactly, it's the one that maximizes the likelihood. There's no uh, thing, but right, so log P of beta, well, it's the one that maximizes the regularized likelihood where you're regularizing by the prior. So log P of beta Z and X is equal to log of P of beta plus log of P of Z, maybe given beta, plus log of P of X given beta and Z, in other words, the log likelihood. And if I only have that first term at play, then Q is gonna want to place its, all of its mass on whichever values of beta and Z maximize that quantity, right? Because if Q spreads its mass to anything else, you're gonna lose. In, 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 as much as you've spread your mass to other things, right? Because they're not as good as the, as the maximum, as the, as the map estimate, which is what that estimate is, the maximum a posteriori estimate. Okay, so the first term prefer, prefers Q to place all its mass on the map estimate. So if I was doing map estimation, I could just optimize that first term. The second term, however, is the entropy. I keep untying my shoe, hold on. Think about the entropy while I tie my shoe. Okay, so what does the second term want us to do? The second term is the entropy. The answer's on the slide if you wanna just read it. If I, wanted, if I only had the second term and I wanted a Q that had high entropy, what would it want the Q to do? Yeah, flatten it. It would want Q to be diffuse, right? If I only want high entropy, I want Q to be diffuse. I want Q to 
spread its probability around many, many different configurations of latent variables. All right, and so these, these terms are at odds. The first term wants all the mass on the map estimate. The second term wants Q to be diffuse. And so the trade-off is what the elbow does. The elbow characterizes this trade-off, okay? One caveat is that the elbow is not convex, okay? So if you look at those mountains over there, that's what the elbow looks like, okay? There's lots of different hills. Um, good, ah, question, yeah. Well, how does it know? So it doesn't know anything, right? It's just an equation. But uh, <laughs> don't tell the AI folks. Um, but the answer is an interesting, que is, is inter the question is interesting, and I don't have a good answer. There is a trade-off. That's all we know, right? That somehow, you know, making Q more diffuse is going to hurt the first term, and making the first term higher through getting putting more mass on the map estimate is going to hurt the second term. And then the, and the trade-off exists in the particular way that you've parameterized log P and log Q. And thinking about that precise trade-off, I think, is a great research question. Yeah. Is there another question? Yeah. I, sorry, I didn't hear you. Can you yell it? Ah, yes, so, well, except this is about KL divergence. So, yeah, it's this objective function has this trade-off. Other objective functions, you'll want to stare at them and meditate on those. Yep. These are all good questions. Okay. So, now, if you, again, go to the archive. Um, I said it was a mixed blessing. It's more of a blessing than a mixed blessing. I love the archive. If you go to the archive and read new papers about variational inference, you'll sometimes see this decomposition, which is the, uh, another decomposition of the elbow. In fact, there's a great paper by Matt Hoffman called Elbow Surgery, Different Ways of Decomposing the Elbow. It's gruesome if you think about it. But, um, and so this is, so if you just look at, here's the original elbow. This is from the 1990s work. Um, now, more recently, some people write the elbow down this way. Which, which is ex the same quantity. It's, there's nothing different about it. Um, but it shows us a different trade-off. So here, um, the first term is the log likelihood. Okay, so this, if I only had this term, I would place all my mass on the MLE, right? I would ignore the regularizers and I'd place all my mass on the MLE, the maximum likelihood estimate of Z and beta. The second term now is the KL divergence between the variational distribution Q and the prior P of beta and Z, okay? And so what this does, this is kind of the, this shows you the classical Bayesian trade-off, is it trades off Q being close to the prior versus Q placing its mass on configurations of hidden variables that explain the data, okay? It's the classical Bayesian trade-off, right? But again, these are the same quantity. Um, but this is another way of writing that quantity that's illuminating. Okay. So that's the objective function. So now, just to be clear, we have our model, LDA. We have a posterior that we care about because we've got millions of documents that we want to calculate the posterior for. We have an objective function where if I minimize that object, if I maximize that objective function, I find the Q that minimizes the KL divergence. But we still haven't totally set up the problem because we still need to specify the form of Q of beta and Z, right? The, the, the form of that ellipse. That's the variational family. And we're going to use, in, throughout the talk today and tomorrow, the mean field variational family. And what the mean field variational family is, is it's a family where each latent variable is independent of each other and has its, is governed by its own parameter, okay? And so for this generic com complete, uh, conditionally conjugate model, Q of beta and Z looks like this. The mean field family for Q of beta and Z is Q of beta with parameter lambda times independently Q of Zi with parameter phi i. Okay? So um, let's just stare at this for a little while, too. First of all, notice that the data do not appear in Q. All right? Q is a family of distributions over the latent variables. 
The data, by definition, is not a latent variable. It's, the data does not appear in Q. It will later in a funny way, but for now it doesn't. Second, if you're a statistician, you might think this is really crazy and vacuous. Okay? Even if you're not a statistician, you might think that. What this is saying is that each variable is independent, but also has its own parameters. So this is just a bunch of wildly independent random variables, each one governed by its own parameter. Each topic assignment of each word of my bazillion word corpus has its own parameter that tells me what topic that particular instance of the word peanut in that article was attached to. And the key idea is that it is only when we optimize the elbow with respect to these variational parameters that we connect these wildly independent random variables to the data. Because when we optimize the elbow, we're minimizing the Kale divergence to the posterior. The posterior is conditional on the data. So when I optimize the elbow, I connect these independent variables here on the right with the data via the posterior on the left. Is that clear? It is in that objective, it is in that optimization that I connect the data and the model to the particular realization of the variational family that I get. Three, if you're a statistician, you might also think it's crazy that everything is independent and that that's really bad, right? Because if you're a statistician, the first thing you learn in statistician school is that it's really bad to do that. Now, here I want to emphasize that while everything is independent, this is actually a very flexible family of distributions in that every single random variable in the model has its own distribution. So it's not the same as IID. It's not that everything is independent and distributed in the same way. Everything is independent, like I said, wildly independent, in, and can capture any distribution it wants. So the word peanut in one article can be assigned to topic nine, through its variational parameters, and the word walnut in another article can be assigned to topic 11 through its variational parameters. Okay, the two topic assignments don't have to come from the same distribution, each is different. So this mean field family can actually capture any marginal, any set of factorized marginals, right? Any marginal distribution of any of the hidden variables in my model can be captured by this variational family. Okay, and this is called the mean field family. So, when you hear the mean field family, what that means, every latent variable is independent and governed by its own distribution. Now, we're gonna make another, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna further restrict this and say, furthermore, each factor is in the same family as the model's complete conditional. Okay, so let's just take Q of beta with variational parameter lambda. If the complete conditional P of beta given Z and X is in some exponential family, let's say it's a Gaussian, that means that Q of beta needs to be a Gaussian too. Now, to be clear, it has a free parameter. So it's a Gaussian with a free mean and variance, lambda. Okay? But the point is it's in the same family as the complete conditional. All right, and that's, and that's what's going on. So imagine I have a model. I've got complete conditionals. Each one is in some exponential family. Let's say one of them is a Gaussian and one of them is a Poisson. I set up my mean field family where I have two independent random variables. One has free Gaussian parameters, the other has free Poisson parameters, okay? What variational inference does then is turns the knobs on those Gaussian parameters and those Poisson parameters so that the particular realization of that family that I have in my hand minimizes the KL divergence to the true posterior of those two variables given the data. Is that clear? That's the game. So now, we have completely specified our problem. My elbow is a function of all the local variational parameters phi and the global variational parameters lambda. And here is the elbow. All right, and so now for every setting of these variables, I can calculate this objective function, and so I can optimize this objective function with respect to those variational parameters. Are there any questions? Hopefully we've made concrete now in black and white what, why I drew that picture in the beginning, right? That picture is every point in that ellipse is a particular setting of lambda and phi, 
and my job is to try to find the setting of lambda and phi that is closest to the exact posterior. And that connects this crazy, everything's wildly independent family of distributions to the, the distribution I care about, which is the posterior. Okay, so that's the variational inference problem, mean field variational inference. Now, traditional variational inference uses coordinate ascent to optimize lambda and phi. And what that means is that, you know, say on my arm are all my variational parameters. I have my lambda and I have all the phi's for each of the local variables. What I do in coordinate ascent is I iteratively optimize each one holding the other ones fixed. Okay, I, I march through all those variational parameters, optimize lambda, optimize phi one, phi two, phi three, and so on, and then go back to the beginning. Optimize lambda again, optimize phi one, phi two, over and over again. I iteratively optimize each one holding the other ones fixed. That's coordinate ascent. And it turns out, this is due to Zubin Germani and Matt Beal, that the updates, the coordinate updates for each variational parameter have a very nice form. If I'm optimizing lambda, its optimal value is the expectation of the natural parameter of its complete conditional. And stare at this for a second. So remember, the natural parameter of its complete conditional is a function of all the other hidden variables and the observations. Taking its expectation because of the mean field assumption is only going to involve the variational parameters that are not lambda, right? Because by definition, in the mean field, everything is independent of each other. So this expectation only depends on phi, which is, makes us happy because if we're doing coordinate descent, we want to optimize this parameter holding everything else fixed. And if the optimum only depends on everything else, then we have a valid coordinate descent algorithm. And so this expectation is with respect to phi is with respect to Z, but only involves phi. And um, since we restricted the factor, the variational factor, to be of the same form as the complete conditional, we know that lambda and eta sit in the same space. Okay, so that means that this is a sensible coordinate update. All right, and the coordinate update for phi is analogous. It's the expectation of the natural parameter of its complete conditional, which depends on xi and beta, the global parameters, the global hidden variables. And that expectation, of course, only depends on the variational factor for the global hidden variables, which has parameters lambda. Clear? Okay, so that's coordinate ascent variational inference. March through and update each one according to this schedule. Notice the relationship to Gibbs sampling, if you're familiar with Gibbs sampling. Like I mentioned earlier, in Gibbs sampling, we iteratively sample from these complete conditionals. Here, we iteratively set the variational factors to be equal to the expected values of the parameters of those complete conditionals. Okay, but they're very similar in spirit. And that's how I got this picture. Okay, so here I've got variational parameters for the color of each point and the locations of each mixture component and I'm plotting an approximate posterior predictive using my fitted Q, and here I'm marching through all of those variational parameters, iteratively updating them, and getting close to the exact posterior. And then here is a picture of the corresponding posterior predictive. <clears throat> so let's just, to make this concrete for the example model we're using, LDA, so here's LDA as a graphical model, and here I embellished it with variational factors. Okay, there's a variational parameter for each set of topic proportions. Like I said, for each word, there's a variational parameter phi, and then for the topics, there's variational parameters lambda. So each topic has its own variational parameter. The mean field distribution is just a big factorized distribution of these hidden variables. And what do we do? We're gonna do coordinate ascent inference. So first we hold the topic parameters fixed and we update the local hidden variables, theta and z, okay? And there's nice closed form updates for those. That's how I got this picture, right? I, the topics are fixed and then I fit variational distributions to theta and z and this is a picture of the variational distribution for theta. In the global step then, I hold all the local distributions, all the local variational parameters fixed, and I update the, the global variational parameter for the, each topic. 
And like I said, that's going to have a special form where it's a sum over the data of some function of those local variational parameters. Okay, so that's the global step. And that's how I got this picture. Okay, that's how I, from the, th this is a picture of the fitted local variational parameters. This is a picture of the fitted global variational parameters. Okay, so each lambda is a distribution over distributions of words. I looked at the posterior expectation of each one, and then I looked at the top words under that posterior expectation. In general, this is the first variational inference algorithm we'll see. Coordinate ascent variational inference, which if you look at the NIPS proceedings from, you know, whatever, 1990 to 2005 and look for papers about variational inference, chances are somebody is rederiving a coordinate ascent variational inference algorithm like this. Then the input to the algorithm is the data and a model. We initialize randomly the variational parameters, and then we march. So for each data point, we set its local variational parameter to its optimal. And then we set the global variational parameter, aggregating all of these um, updates to its optimal, and then repeat, okay? That's LDA inference. And just to emphasize, we've derived this now for a big class of models. <clears throat> okay. Next, I want to talk about stochastic variational inference, which builds on this. Okay, so we just covered, whatever, 15 years of variational inference research. But this is inefficient, right? Classical variational inference is inefficient. Why? What do we do? We do some local computation for each data point. And then we aggregate these computations to re-estimate the global structure and repeat. Okay, and so just, again, with topic modeling, you can see this immediately. You know, when we started working on topic modeling, we were analyzing 10,000, 15,000 documents. It's no problem. But then as the years wore on, we uh, started wanting to analyze millions of documents, right, and tens of millions of documents. And, and this doesn't work in that setting. Why? Because what happens? You, you initialize your variational parameters to garbage topics, right, uninterpretable topics, total garbage. And then the variational inference tells you that you need to march through all of your documents with those garbage topics and painstakingly analyze how they reflect them, right? I go through all 10 million articles analyzing how they exhibit these garbage topics before I can update the garbage topics to something more meaningful. And the problem is you might not even, you might have too many documents to even get through this once, okay? So this is inefficient. Stochastic variational inference scales variational inference to massive data. Oh, do you have a question? Oh, okay, that's okay. Any questions? I haven't paused for questions in a while. Yeah. There is, yeah. Right, so good, good question. So the, I'll repeat the question. Um, the question was, does it always converge? The answer is yes. And the, the second question is, I mentioned earlier that the elbow is not convex. Is that a problem? No. Okay, good. <laughs> so, it is, I'm just kidding, it is a problem. <laughs> so the, I'm right about the first thing. It's always gonna converge. Five minutes, okay. Oh, take a break in five minutes? Okay. I mean, I'm dodging the question about the non-convexity of the elbow right now, so <laughs> this is a really good timing. Yeah. <laughs> um, good. So, uh, oh, right, we, that's what we were talking about. So, uh, right, so this is, gonna, this is guaranteed to converge to a local optimum of the elbow. And so in practice, what happens? In practice, it's just like EM you're very sensitive to the initialization. And one open problem in variational inference is how to initialize variational inference well. Okay, so you know, sometimes in the middle of the night, I wake up with an idea of how to initialize variational inference well, but then after like three weeks of implementing it and working on it, I learn that it doesn't work. And um, you know, I hope that you will all now do the same thing. Uh, and to see that it, that it converges to a local optimum, I refer you to the proof that EM converges. It's really identical. Now, the elbow is non-convex, so in practice, there's all kinds of stuff about things like randomly restarting the, um, uh, randomly restarting the, the optimization algorithm. 
and, um, and then choosing the local optimum that is best. Now that's not guaranteed to be the best local optimum overall local optima, but um, it's the best one that you got anyway. Um, that said, this is another interesting open research problem. I think that there's been a lot of really good research lately about characterizing the non-convex deep learning objective and taking inspiration from that literature and thinking about the variational objective is a worthwhile open research problem. Two, there's a lot of research about how stochastic optimization, which we're gonna get to in a second, um, finds better local optima in these kinds of non-convex settings. And I think looking at that research and thinking about the variational objective is also a good idea, a good open research problem. Um, in practice, you saw it with that mixture model and you see it with the topics and the whole list of, of pictures I showed you in the very beginning of the uh, talk, which all use variational inference. In practice, we often do well as a practical empirical matter just being satisfied with the best local optima we can find. But if you talk to my students and postdocs, they will tell you that they do spend some time thinking about smart ways to initialize. Good. Okay, so we wanna scale this up. It's inefficient, we wanna scale it up. And what I'm gonna do now is derive for you stochastic variational inference. And at the end of the derivation, you're gonna see an algorithm that has this very intuitive structure where, so, I've got my model, P of Z comma P of beta ZX, and um, I've got a massive data set, and I want to, I want to approximate the posterior. The algorithm's gonna look like this. So at any point in the algorithm, I have my idea of the global hidden structure. I have my idea of the global variational parameters that could be started randomly. I'm gonna subsample a little bit of data. I'm gonna ask how that data exhibits that global structure. And then I'm gonna use those inferences to somehow update that global structure, and I'm gonna repeat. Okay, so again, just using LDA as a concrete example, I'm gonna grab a handful of documents rather than having, I'm gonna start out with garbage topics as usual, but I'm gonna take a handful of documents rather than having to march through all 10 million. I'm gonna ask, how does this handful um, exhibit these garbage topics? And then I'm gonna use the results of that little local inference to update the garbage topics to make them a little less garbagey. Okay, then I'm gonna grab another handful, look at them, make them less garbagey, another handful, and so on until the topics eventually look good. And you can see just looking at this computational flow that this is gonna be much more efficient than having to take my garbage topics and painstakingly analyze all the documents with that garbage topics. Okay, so what's the key idea? The key idea, and I guess maybe we'll end after talking about the key idea. Um, the key idea is to use stochastic optimization. And the idea behind stochastic optimization, first of all, let's just not talk about variational inference or anything else for a moment and just talk about stochastic optimization. Stochastic optimization is an amazing idea. It was invented by Herb Robbins in 1951. That's like 67 years ago or something like that. And um, the idea is that when I'm doing optimization, I can replace the gradient that might be expensive to calculate with cheaper, noisy estimates of the gradient. And what Robbins and Monroe showed is that when you do this, this is guaranteed to converge to an optimum of a convex function. Leon Botu, who popularized convex, uh, stochastic optimization in machine learning, showed that it's guaranteed to converge to a local optimum as well. All right? This is the idea. Like, all these companies, they're interested in machine learning because of this. This is the idea that has enabled machine learning. The reason we're here and are well-funded and have t-shirts and pieces of gum in our <laughs> bags is because of stochastic optimization, okay? Um, and the idea is very simple. It, it's, it's very intuitive. So when I teach stochastic optimization to my students, this is how I do it. So imagine, I don't use South Africa as an example, but imagine we're here in Stellenbosch and we're trying to get to Johannesburg, and everybody's drunk, okay? So, I don't know, maybe it's New Year's Eve. Is there a holiday in South Africa where this, this happens? Okay, I use St. Patrick's Day at home, but here, okay. So, everybody's drunk, it's New Year's Eve, and we're trying to walk from Stellenbosch to Johannesburg. Seems crazy, but that's what we're trying to do. Um, you're not drunk, okay, you're sober. <clears throat> You walk out and you see McKellery and you say, hey, I need to get to Johannesburg. McKellery's drunk. And you say, how do I get there? And he just points in some direction before collapsing on the sidewalk. 
Now, what Herb Robbins wants you to do is walk 1,000 kilometers in that direction. Okay? Doesn't matter where he pointed, just walk in that direction. Assume that there's no oceans. Okay? <laughs> you're, the, you're now in wherever. It's time to stop. But this is like the story I'm telling. <laughs> you're now in the middle of whatever, and, um, and you see Ben, and Ben's drunk too, and, um, and you say, hey, how do I get to Johannesburg? And Ben points in some random direction. You walk 500 kilometers in that direction. You then see Shakir, who's telling you to stop talking, and he's drunk, as usual, <laughs> and you say, Shakir, how do I get to Johannesburg? I'm walking. Shakir points in some direction before falling over, walk 250 miles in that direction. You see Bernard, he's drunk, you ask him how to get to Johannesburg, you walk 125 miles in that direction. And here's the deal. This is stochastic optimization. As long as you shorten how long you walk each time you ask a drunk person how to get to Johannesburg, you can just imagine, and one, and two, if you could magically revive Shakir and ask him over and over again how to get to Johannesburg, he would, the average of where he pointed, pointed directly at Johannesburg, right? So in other words, Shakir provides us an unbiased view of where Johannesburg is, even if he's pointing in the wrong direction because he's uh, wasted. Then, um, then if you reduce that distance each time you walk, you are eventually going to get to Johannesburg. It might be less than efficient in that you are walking in lots of wrong directions as you ask drunk people how to get there, but you'll eventually land right at Johannesburg. And that's exactly stochastic optimization. If I can find a cheap, noisy gradient of my objective function, I can follow it with a special schedule that we'll get to tomorrow um, and get to the optimum. And that's the idea that is driving all of machine learning today. Um, also, by the way, Herb Robbins invented bandits, which is the foundations of reinforcement learning, and he invented empirical bays, which is part of the foundation of probabilistic machine learning. So whatever he put in his pipe is what you are interested in putting in your pipe as well. <laughs> and um, good. So we'll get back to more technical things tomorrow, and we'll discuss how to apply this idea of stochastic optimization to variational inference. <laughs>